This is the second part of the lecture on mimics of perineural spread. What about malignancies? Well, metastases might be confusing, particularly if they have leptomeningeal spread along nerves. Malignant nerve sheath tumors, um, just like the schwannoma, can be con uh, confused with perineal spread. Of course, a malignant nerve sheath tumor could, uh, will have a very similar appearance. And I suppose while we're in the category of malignancy, we should mention that perineural spread looks like perineural spread, sort of trivially. So here's a metastasis filling up Meckel's cave. That's what it's supposed to look like on the other side. So it is the Meckel's cave is filled and expanded. We talked about how this is a classic finding of perineural spread, and it is. But other things can expand uh, Meckel's cave like a metastasis to the cave. A malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, the malignant version of a schwannoma, uh, can expand and travel along a nerve. Uh, it looks very much like a schwannoma in most cases, but, um, but, but it belongs in the category of malignancy for our discussions. So if you saw this enhancement along cranial nerve three, both sides, uh, both sides of cranial nerve three, it would be very easy to look at that and say that's perineural spread of, uh, of malignancy. It looks just like the lymphoma case that I showed at the beginning of the lecture. Um, the only clue you'd have here is that there are other examples of leptomeningeal spread of disease in this patient with breast cancer, in particular here in the superior aspect of the posterior fossa. Here's another example of leptomeningeal spread, this time along the uh, seventh and eighth cranial nerves. Uh, it looks exactly like perineural spread of tumor. Let's talk about infections that can mimic perineural spread of tumor. Uh, bacterial infections, fungal infections, uh, Lyme disease, absolutely classic for enhancement along the cranial nerves, classic in that disease. Tuberculosis, I'm absolutely certain can, can do this, although uh, I, I won't be showing you any examples because I don't come from a place where it's end, end, endemic. Viral neuritis can be very confusing, and whether you want to consider these diseases uh, a viral infection or a post-viral response to the infection, um, we'll put them in both categories. Ramsey Hunt being sort of the classic example causing uh, enhancement of the seventh and eighth cranial nerves. Here is a bacterial cellulitis that originated in the orbit and traveled back along uh, V2 uh, into Meckel's cave and then back along the trunk of the fifth cranial nerve to expand into the brainstem and eventually posterior fossa. So this is a huge abscess, bacterial abscess in the brain, but it all came from spread from the orbit. You can see in cross section how this looks like spread along a nerve. It really is spread of infection, not tumor, along a nerve. The abscess gives it away in this particular case, but perineural spread of tumor will occasionally find some uh, wonderful place to expand uh, and have a very similar appearance to this. Invasive fungal sinusitis. You knew this one was coming. Invasive fungal sinusitis spreads like a tumor. It loves perineural involvement. Uh, a look at the pterygopalatine fossa and uh, through the, uh, the pterygomaxillary fissure here and into the infratemporal fossa, lots of erosion, just like a tumor would do, just filling out these, uh, these nervous sections. And in, and in coronal, it looks exactly the same with the pterygopalatine fossa, just packed with tumor, replacement of the normal fat. And you can see it coming up into the inferior orbital fissure as well as out into the nose through the sphenopalatine foramen. So complete filling of all of these classic nerve spaces and a classic pattern for perineural spread. Invasive fungal sinusitis looks just like a tumor in so many ways. Here's another way where invasive fungal sinusitis looks just like a tumor.
More examples of invasive fungal sinusitis. Um, here we are completely filling uh, the pterygopalatine fossa, replacing the normal fat there, tracking back along uh, Vidian's nerve here and along V2 up here, filling the orbital apex. Exactly the sort of appearance you'd expect for perineural spread, but this is an infection. Lyme disease, famous for causing enhancement along cranial nerves. Here's the trunk of the fifth cranial nerve. So this trigeminal enhancement looks just like perineal spread. Could this be a, a malignancy that spread to, um, to the Gasserian ganglion is coming back from Meckel's cave? Yeah, it would look just like that traveling back towards the brainstem. But this is a, a CNS infection that classically causes nerves to enhance. Ramsey Hunt is a herpetic infection that affects predominantly the seventh and eighth cranial nerves, and you'll see enhancement along those nerves, a, a viral neuritis um, uh, as an expected finding in this particular infection. Obviously looks just like perineural spread would before it starts to thicken the nerve. All right. Uh, what about inflammatory diseases that are not infectious? Well, sarcoid, boy, sarcoid can do anything. And once you start talking about sarcoid, you might as well talk about granulomatosis with polyangiitis, that is Wegener's granulomatosis, uh, optic neuritis, uh, probably not that confusing in most instances, but if you had a tumor that um, originated in the uh, orbit and then had a case of optic neuritis, you can see where that would get confusing. Pseudotumor, uh, IG. G4 related pseudotumors look very much like optic neuritis. Bell's palsy, we can argue about whether this is really uh, infectious or inflammatory. I don't think it really matters for this discussion. And all sorts of labyrinthitis. We'll talk also about Miller Fisher syndrome, which is a variant of Guillain Barre. Okay, sarcoid. Sarcoid can cause linear tiny areas of enhancement along nerves, or it can cause bulky enhancement along nerves. This looks exactly like the very first case I showed in this lecture that I called a classic appearance for perineural spread of tumor, it, thickening of the nerve, abnormal enhancement of the nerve, expansion of the foramen. It's got all the classic signs. It's also got some enhancement in other areas that uh, may or may not be related to the sarcoid itself. Uh, you can see uh, here the same findings coming into Meckel's cave, uh, expanding Meckel's cave, and then extending along the uh, dura of the middle cranial fossa. This is sarcoid. This looks just like perineural spread. Wegener's granulomatosis. Again, here we're seeing the inferior orbital fissure and extension down into the pterygopalatine ganglion, uh, pterygopalatine fossa here. Uh, this is what it should look like on the other side. Classic appearance here for perineural spread along uh, V2 and the infraorbital nerve and the pterygopalatine ganglion. Optic neuritis. So in optic neuritis, we often get that classic tram track look of enhancement along either side of the optic nerve. That's what we've got here. Pretty classic look, the nerve itself enhancing in its canalicular segment. If you had a, uh, a squamous cell carcinoma that had found its way to the nerve, could it track back like this? Absolutely it could, probably not symmetrically like that. Um, this is a pretty classic look for optic neuritis, um, but you can see where perineural spread would have a similar appearance if it managed to get along the dura of the second cranial nerve. Pseudotumor, maybe even a little more confusing because there's often some enhancement extending into the surrounding fat that, that might be a little more confusing with an aggressive tumor, but essentially the same appearance that we were talking about for optic neuritis when orbital pseudotumor is in its perineuritis form. Remember, pseudotumor's got a lot of different forms and any of them could be confused with perineural spread of tumor.
Labyrinthitis. Labyrinthitis can be infectious, and maybe uh, some forms of labyrinthitis should have been in the infectious portion of this lecture, but it can uh, be post-traumatic. Uh, it can be uh, autoimmune inflammatory. Any of the forms of labyrinthitis, um, even labyrinthitis ossificans, can look enough like perineural spread. When perineural spread gets into the cochlea, it doesn't just go right up the center of the medialis. It also spreads out into other aspects of the cochlea. And so this enhancement along the spiral of the cochlea could ab absolutely be seen in perineural spread um, and, of course, a uh, classic appearance for labyrinthitis. Bell's palsy, uh, a classic finding. How do you know that this is a Bell's palsy and not perineural spread? Well, one of the things you're looking for here is whether the nerve is expanded. This nerve is about the same size I'd expect for a nerve, so that's a clue that you're dealing with Bell's palsy. But I'll tell you, sometimes perineural spread doesn't expand the nerve, so it's not perfect. And this is one of the real clinical conundrums in the setting of Bell's palsy. Are you really looking at a, a Bell's palsy that's going to get better in a couple of months um, without any treatment at all? Or is this the initial manifestation of an aggressive tumor of the parotid gland that its first clinical manifestation is to take out the seventh cranial nerve? A classic problem for the, um, for the uh, ENT surgeons and thus a classic problem uh, for us as well in ENT radiology to distinguish these. The sorts of clues you use are the size of the nerve um, and you always trace the nerve down all the way through the parotid gland in these situations to make sure that you're not missing a mass of the parotid gland itself. But this is a classic imaging and clinical dilemma distinguishing Bell's palsy from perineural spread of tumor. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, why is he showing us an example of Guillain-Barre disease in a lecture on head and neck pathology? But this is a classic picture of Guillain-Barre. It's a nice picture, a classic picture where the nerve roots in the cauda equina are abnormally enhancing in axial and uh, sagittal sections. And it's just a reminder of what this particular uh, inflammatory disease, autoimmune inflammatory disease, uh, does to nerve roots. But you're thinking to yourself, okay, but this is a bottom up disease. It always affects the, the cauda equina and then works its way up the spine. Why do I care about it in head and neck imaging? The answer is that there is a form of Guillain-Barre syndrome that instead of starting at the bottom and working its way up, starts at the top and works its way down. That variant is called Miller-Fisher syndrome. And the first thing to start enhancing is the cranial nerves, like this vague enhancement along the fifth cranial nerve, or this not so vague enhancement, looks just like the Bell's palsy, along the facial nerve. We know this isn't normal facial nerve enhancement because A, it really is a lot of enhancement, and B, the involvement of the, uh, the, the canalicular segment of the facial nerve. So this is, this is Miller-Fisher syndrome, a variant of Guillain-Barre. Other things that can mimic perineural spread of tumor include secondary effects from other diseases. Uh, denervation atrophy, it's a shame that denervation atrophy is coming so late in this lecture because it, it's arguably the most important mimic of perineural spread and the one that is the most confusing, but here's where it fits in the lecture. Denervation atrophy can look just like perineural spread of disease. Um, Post-op changes, uh, like the residual dural tail we talked about with meningioma, or if you decompress one of these nerve canals, that, that canal is going to look abnormal uh, henceforth. So here's a picture of denervation atrophy of the of the fifth cranial nerve and thus the muscles of mastication. So how do I know that this is denervation atrophy and not spread of tumor? How do I know that this tumor didn't come from Meckel's cave, spread down here and just infiltrate through all of these muscles? The answer is in the tendons. If you have denervation atrophy, the tendons do not abnormally enhance, just the muscle fibers themselves. So you can see spared tendons all through all of these muscles. If this were a tumor, it would have no respect for tendons or muscles. It eats everything in its path. And so the sparing of the tendons 
amidst extensive areas of enhancement are a clue that you're actually dealing with denervation atrophy. Remember that denervation atrophy comes in several phases. In the early phases, there's abnormal enhancement and edema. And although we call it all denervation atrophy, it, the muscles don't really become atrophied for an arbitrarily long period of time. This appearance can persist for years without loss of the size of the muscle. So maybe denervation atrophy is not a great term, but that's what we call this. Here's denervation atrophy again, this time in the axial. Um, could this look like infiltration of tumor, all this abnormal enhancement here surrounding uh, the uh, origin of the temporalis muscle? It could, um, but here we're seeing the tendon, the temporalis tendon that uh, attaches um, at the coronoid process, and we're just above the tip of the coronoid. This is tendon, and tendon is preserved. It's just muscle that's abnormal. The tendon is fine, and that's our clue that we're dealing with denervation atrophy of these muscles and not something infiltrative that would take out the tendon as well. After somebody has operated on a uh, nerve or its, or its canal or anywhere along its path, we'll often get abnormal enhancement or expansion of the canal. So for example, this labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve might appear quite abnormal on imaging, but this has been uh, surgically decompressed and that's why it looks expanded the same way perineural spread of tumor would expand the canal. So if I were to go back and look at what I thought were the top three most confusing mimics of perineural spread. I would say that the ones that I most frequently see confused or, ab or incorrectly called perineural spread when films come in from other locations are denervation atrophy, particularly of the muscles of mastication. That's where that is most confusing. The pterygoid venous plexus, because it can be so asymmetric and make you think there's something on one side and not the other. And then an inflammatory or infectious neuritis where there is slight enhancement along the entire course of a nerve. Of course, in the setting of Bell's palsy is where that is the most confusing for everybody um, and is a tough conundrum for us. So I think that's a pretty broad look at all the potential mimics of perineural spread. And so next time you see something you're about to call perineural spread, make sure it really is and isn't one of these other mimics.